This morning we looked at uh, what does it mean to strive with the church that is always both Rachel and Leah. And how can we learn to love Leah in obedience to the command to do so? Tonight I want to look more specifically at uh, striving with work in general. Not just work as pastors, but the whole notion of work. And I want to look particularly at some of the ways in which that has changed generationally. We're going to get to Genesis 30 a little bit later in the talk, but I don't want to start there. Um, Genesis 30 tells the story of Jacob who's a little disillusioned in his own work. Uh, a very common trans-historic experience. But I want to back up uh, before getting to the text tonight and tell you about the difference in work for my grandfather and my 34-year-old daughter. And use these as types for what has happened over the course of a few generations. At our home, we have uh, six large black and white photographs that hang up on the dining room wall. All six of these photographs were taken of a family sitting on a farm porch. The farm was in Tarboro, North Carolina. It raised tobacco. All six of these generations are my ancestors. Each family sitting on the porch had inherited the farm from the family in the picture right before them. The last two people who are on the porch is my grandmother, Ada Barnes, and her husband, Clarence Solomon Barnes. They were the last to live on the, on the farm. If you want to do the Q&A, we can talk about what happened with my father's generation to invite them to leave the farm. Uh, when you look at these pictures, these, um, these people look like they belong on a farm. It, it's really hard to tell where the farm stops and the farmer starts. <laughs> they were just so shaped and molded by the land. Just, it, was, it was everything in their identity. And it had, uh, it had molded them. I spent my summers on this farm and I know how much it had molded them. I also know how hard the work was, but nobody really talked too much about that. When the roots phenomena was big, I was in college. What was it, about 35 years ago, maybe? Uh, remember Alex Haley's? 1976. Okay. Oh, so, so more than that, but, yeah. Um, so my brother and I went back to the farm. My grandmother was still on it at the time. We wanted to know where we came from. And she told us about the six generations of tobacco farmers that had lived on this farm. We said, well, Grandma, we grew up hearing these stories. We know that. But where did we come from in order to get here? She shrugged. She says, I don't know. We've always lived here on this farm. He said, well, not always. I, I, we came from some place. I'm thinking Europe. She was offended by the notion that we had European ancestry. <laughs> Grandma, a smart woman, said, no, uh, we've always lived here. And so in my grandma's mind, the Garden of Eden was right outside Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. <laughs> Adam and Eve only made it as far as Tarboro, and then they just stayed there. As ridiculous as that is, it demonstrates how the oral tradition had uh, woven out any uh, ancestry from any place other than North Carolina. That's where we're from. That's where we belong. Because they were shaped and molded by that particular piece of land. Now there's a seventh photo that also hangs up on its own wall. And this photo is of my grandfather when he was a young man. It's taken in Miami, Florida. He's wearing a zoot suit and he's holding a saxophone and he's sitting on a crescent moon. When I got these photographs from my aunt, I said, what is this? All the stories I heard on that porch in that farm, I never heard anything about granddaddy hanging the moon in Miami, Florida. <laughs> she says, well, she says, when daddy was a young man, he had this crazy dream that he, he wanted to try out for the big bands. And so uh, finally he did it and he hitchhiked a ride down to Miami and he got this audition and he got into the band. I said, well, you go, granddad. She says, well, it didn't really work out so well. She says, after six weeks on the road with the band, he decided it was time to come home <laughs> because he countered alcohol and even narcotics at, at that time. He had never seen that before. And he encountered women who scared him. And so the prodigal this took the bus back and never again left the farm. Died on that farm. 
here's the significance of that story for me. Before my grandfather ever tried to rebel from his identity, he had already inherited it. And that's what home used to do. Home told you who you are and what your mission is in life. For generations and generations and generations, throughout history, for long periods of time, that's how people knew who they were, identity, and mission, what they're supposed to do with their life. Nobody ever asked my grandfather, would you like to be a tobacco farmer? Nobody ever put him on their knee when he was little and asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? He was going to be a farmer. And if he wanted to rebel from that identity for a while and sow some wild oats, he could. But he would have to come back. Because that identity had already been shaped in him by his parents and his grandparents, who lived in the same farmhouse, and aunts and uncles who lived in farmhouses just down the road, and his Sunday school teacher, who was also his public school teacher, and the preacher of the Tarboro Baptist Church, and his lifelong love, my grandmother, who said she wouldn't marry him until he got this fool idea out of his head about the bands. And the only time in his otherwise purposeful life that he was unhappy was when he tried to be somebody other than who his home told him that he was. That's what home used to do, identity and mission. I have no desire to go back to these times. I'm not advocating it. I'm just telling you it was a different way of understanding your mission in life and who you really are. Let me contrast that with Lindsay, my 34-year-old daughter. She's grown up in an environment where she's very confused about home. And so are most of her friends. When I was work, doing a writing project on the subject of home, I interviewed her while she, that time she was in college, and her friends, where is home? And they got frustrated with the interview because they didn't like their answers. Some of them, like Lindsay, would talk about the three cities that she lived in before she went to college. But now her parents were living in a different city. So where exactly would the home be for her? Other, of her friends started saying sentimental things like home is where I hang my hat, or home is where my friends are, or I now have a virtual sense of home with, with my friends who are kind of everywhere. Right, if you ask them where will you live when you get out of college, they had not a clue. But it wouldn't necessarily be the place that they grew up in. It would probably be wherever they found a job or some high adventure that they wanted to, to pursue. So since home has historically provided us clarity about identity and mission. Since we now live in a society that's relatively confused about home and incredibly transient, that means that we're also confused about identity and mission. And how is it that we learn who we are and what we're supposed to be doing? In fact, we've actually developed the exact opposite advice to our kids. Rather than saying home will tell you who you are and what you will do, now the advice we give to our kids is you should go out and decide for yourself who you will be. Home is something you have to leave behind to find yourself at some mythical place out there. You go and find yourself out there, and that's how you know who you are and what you're supposed to be doing with your life, what kind of work you're supposed to have. The way that that's going to happen for you, that you're going to find yourself, is through the self-construction of identity. That's a dramatically different way of getting an identity from the way my grandfather did. Now identity is self-constructed. Again, nobody tells you who you are. You should decide for yourself who you are. We've taken all the liens off of you. No longer will your parents uh, get in your way and say you have to do this. You're supposed to decide this for yourself. And the way that you make this construction of an identity is through choices. We're very big on choices. Anybody who's done parenting, and the last generation knows that it's all about teaching choices. So when Johnny throws a rock through the window, you're not supposed to run out there and grab Johnny. You're supposed to invite him into the house, look at the broken window, look at the rock on the floor and say, now Johnny, was this a good choice? And Johnny, who's a smart young man, knows to say, I'm thinking not. Oh, good. We've learned not to do this because it's good choice making. And then it gets more complicated as kids get older, and you get, there gets to be more at stake between good choices and bad choices. And you try to have some influence on kids making good choices, healthy choices, choices that will keep them off of substance abuse, choices that will keep them away from the people who are going to hurt them, uh, healthy, good, positive choices. But even while we're doing that, we're still telling them to choose their own belief system. And schools, except for parochial schools, 
are pretty big on telling kids, you've got you've to figure out a belief system. And good teaching, good pedagogy, is not the teacher up here lecturing and telling you what to believe, but creating conversation and discussions, and maybe teaching Socratically, so that everybody has a chance <coughs> to then decide for themselves what they think, to choose their beliefs. When uh, my daughter was in high school, the head of her school uh, had an assembly with parents. And she, I know she was just trying to affirm the creativity of the school, but she said to the parents, here at our school, we tell our kids there's no such thing as a bad idea. <laughs> now that went down smoothly. But then I started thinking about it. Really? <laughs> there's no such thing as a bad idea? And the more I thought about it, the anger I got, I started, I was getting interested in cardiac arrest at this point. <laughs> the, 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 yes, there are bad ideas out there. There's some very bad ideas. And telling a bunch of teenagers that there are no bad ones is one of the worst ideas <laughs> I've heard. Think about how much horror has happened in the world that started out as ideas, like racial purification, and, uh, the genocides even in, in uh, Cambodia began with a bunch of disillusioned intellectuals who were studying Nietzsche in, in Paris, and they went to the coffee shops afterwards to think Nietzsche didn't go far enough. And now, next thing we have is the killing fields. Start out as just some ideas at a coffee shop. I, there are some very, very bad ideas. And, uh, but kids are just taught, you need to decide what good ideas are, more choosing. All of this choosing thing starts to come to a head when kids uh, get to, to college. There's the whole panic of choosing a college <laughs> And you have like reach schools and safety schools, and you really hope that your reach school isn't your friend's safety school. And you hope that the school that you choose will choose you, and it's very drama, dramatic and very stressful. And then after somehow we survive that, then the next thing that happens when these kids get to into college, their freshman year, is we tell them, choose a major. <laughs> Only they don't think they're choosing a major, they think they're choosing a life. Yeah. But they're 18 years old. They don't know what they're going to do for their life. How many of us are doing what we thought we were going to do at 18? Not too many. So they don't know, but they've got to pick a life. And so all you do is you get on the registrar's website and you indicate what your major will be. And so they think, okay, what will I do for the rest of my life? Well, there are those great doctor shows on TV. I, I, I could do that. Yeah, I'll be a doctor. Pre-med. Select, enter. They're going to be a doctor. That took five minutes. Then they take biology 101. And they realize, I'm not going to be a doctor. It's not a problem. You just get back on the registrar's website another time. You can change this major. So pre-med, delete, 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 delete. All right, what else will I do? I know, pre-law. <laughs> Doctors wear nice clothes, like high drama in the courtroom. That sounds exciting. Pre-law. Boom. They just changed their major, but what they think they changed is the entire trajectory of their life. And they got to choose it, and it took five minutes to do it. As I watched Lindsay go through college, I realized you can do this four times. You each, have, each time you have the right to choose and to choose again and to choose again and choose again. And they, again, under the illusion that you're changing your life by your own choices. Then when they somehow get out of college, what's the next thing that we say to them? Pick a job. Any job you want. I remember vividly saying this to her. Any job at all, sweetheart. Just pick a job. <laughs> Benefits would be nice. Yes. Then when they get these jobs that they chose, that have turned out to be not what they wanted it to be. This is where it gets significant. The mindset of going to the registrar's website stays with them. It's actually the mindset they've been given since they were kids. I should be able to pick again. So if you don't like your job, choose a different job. If you don't like your church, choose a different church. If you don't like your community, you don't like your friends, just choose again. And as pastors, you, you know that you have parishioners who are using up their fleeting lives, constantly choosing again and again and again and again, trying to find a life that they're eventually going to like. That's the danger of this. 
living without an inheritance. When Lindsay graduated from college, I couldn't believe that the commencement speaker at George Washington looked out over 5,000 graduates and paddled the exact same dribble I heard when I graduated from college. You are among the brightest and best we have ever seen. <laughs> Set your goals high, dream your own dreams, and you can be anything you want to be. Really? Really? I mean, he might as well have said, I'm sorry, we have nothing for you, you're all on your own. <laughs> At least that would have been honest. Right. Because the message is, it's all out there, relationships, spirituality, vocations, community, volunteerism, social action, it's just a la carte. And you just pick and choose as you go down, trying to find a life that you will like, that you will enjoy. Those of us who are spiritually minded, who been nurtured in this environment of choice, very much want God's help with our choices. It's interesting that we don't challenge the notion that we can choose our way into an identity. What we're asking for is a little advice from above as we make our choices. It's still nowhere near what my grandfather had. Again, I'm not romanticizing that. I'm just saying we've gone through a dramatic historical shift in the last couple of generations which has a dramatic impact on work. Because a lot of pressure is put on work that didn't used to be there. Because now work is a means of finding a life, not just finding employment. Whereas people used to think of work as a means of putting food on the table. Or if you're in a profession, you did it because you had a certain uh, calling or training for this. But now, now work is where people spend, frankly, most of their hours, a lot more than they spend at home, at least consciously at home. Uh, and so it's, it's work is having to take over the identity giving purposes of home and the mission. The work is supposed to give you both. What do you do for a living? What's that, like the second question that comes up at a party and what do you do for a living? I'm trying to figure out who you are. If I know what you do for a living, I'll know something about your identity. Um, and then, this is of course, then how you just made your mission. That's why Christians work so hard to get God's help. And that's why, if you've ever done uh, Bible studies for college students, you know that there's two topics that you're going to be talking about in no time. It's either relationship or pursuing the will of God. Uh, and they just they can't. They're addicted to these topics because they want to get it right. Because they realize how much is at stake. They're trying to find themselves pursuing the will of God. Uh, it isn't just limited to college students. It comes up later and later. Maybe it comes up even in our own lives periodically. But that's a whole different understanding than much of what the Bible talks about when it talks about the will of God. God's will mostly is that we uh, be reconciled to God, that we recover from our alienated lives, that we be free to a life in Christ. I remember uh, one time I was preaching out of Ephesians, and I was really caught up in the first chapter with how many times uh, the Apostle talks about living in Christ, living in Christ, living in Christ. He says it over and over. I think it comes up, I remember counting nine times in 14 verses. Life in Christ. And that's actually a rough thing to preach on, for, to make people in the pews really get what it means to live in Christ. And we've tried saying, well, how do you live in love? Or how do you, what is it, the ancient understanding of living in vicariously? It's, it's complicated. So I was really working hard on this sermon, trying to talk about life in Christ. And um, what does it mean that in the incarnation, the Spirit has pressed Christ to us, and in sanctification, the Spirit presses us to Christ to the point where we are adopted into the Son's beloved relationship with the Father. And you kind of have to go Trinitarian, I think, to make sense of this term. I was really caught up with this image of adoption into the life of the beloved, and I had run across um, this wonderful commentary on this text by um, um, Irenaeus, who was talking about how the Father reaches out two arms. This is one of the first Trinitarian theologies we were given. One of the arms is the Spirit, and the other arm is the Son. And it's like the father of the prodigal who sees us coming down the road and the father rushes to us and with spirit and son 
brings us to his breast, giving us all that he has to give because he gives us both hands. This is what the apostle means by every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It was the first time I got that, what that meant. You have received every spiritual blessing of the heavenly places. And giving us the Spirit and the Son, God has given us all that heaven has to give. This is an incredible, incredible thing. All that it has to give. I was in Korea last uh, month. Apparently, if you're a seminary president, you have to go to Korea. Um, and uh, the, the churches there are enormous in size, as you've all heard. And there's always gift giving. They bring gifts because you're going to get gifts. They're big on gift giving. And some of these are small. And I've noticed after a while that everybody, when they hand out a gift, they always use two hands. So they present with both hands like this. It's an interesting custom. And so I finally said, oh, okay, I, just, I'm, I know it's a custom, but tell me, what does that mean? That even if you're giving little gifts, you always give two-handed giving. And they said, well, that's just an old custom. It means that we're symbolically, with this gift, giving you all that we have to give. Most of my giving is one-handed giving. I hear about a need, I think, you need that? Yeah, you can have that, because I got this. But our need at this point was, was that in giving us the Spirit and the Son, God's given us all that God has to give. So about the time I had this breakthrough of my morning sermon preparation, later in the week, uh, one of the college students uh, who's graduating comes in to see me, and he wants to talk to me about his job choices. And he's got a job offer in accounting in Chicago and another one in uh, Houston, I think it was. Chicago or Houston. And he's been praying about which job he should take. And so he wants my advice and my counsel on this. And I know this guy. He's a spiritual overachiever. Um, he, he was the kind of guy who would, who would really worry about this. And so I said, well, how wonderful that you have two job offers. There's so many people that don't have any. He goes, yeah, 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 yeah I know. But I, I, I want to be certain about what God wants me to do. And so he shows me his prayer journal. And so I'm reading his prayer journal. And this hour is seeming very long to me. Um, and I can't seem to get him off of the, the, the anxiety. And so we pray together, and I pray that he would be free to make choices. He, he prayed that he would be certain of what God wanted him to do. When we got down to prayer, he finally looked at me and he said, he says, well, Dr. Barnes, you still haven't told me what I should do. Which job should I take? And with as much spiritual profundity as I could muster up, I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's always at this point that people figure out why pastoral counseling is free. <laughs> How could I know that? I don't know. Let me tell you what I do know. And then I went into this whole thing with Irenaeus. And, the, and what God is really concerned about, that, that, he, that this kid knows what it's like to be caught up in the arms of the Spirit and the Son, and that he's already received every spiritual blessing in heaven. He said, God is not up all night worrying about whether you go to Houston or Chicago. He was almost taken aback by that. I said, this is what God's concerned about. This is, you want to know the will of God? The will of God is you find yourself into these arms, receiving every spiritual blessing, your life in Christ. That's what God's will is for you. So, yeah, like Chicago or, or Houston. <laughs> it's not as though the Holy Trinity is up there saying, boy, I really hope Ryan picks Chicago, because if he picks Houston, we, we can't do anything for him there. <laughs> God, God owns all the cities. Just make a choice, will you? <laughs> and, and then free yourself to get back to the things that God has already chosen, like giving you all that heaven has to give. <laughs> But again, that's the problem of being spiritual, still thinking that choices make your life. Because you get terrified, we're back to fear again. You get terrified of making a wrong choice. Then you've missed the will of God, and then you've missed God. Where we're not really attending to the things that Scripture is abundantly clear on when it comes to the will of God. All right, finally to Jacob. That was all just introduction. Um, Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. When Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know very well the service I've given you. But Laban said to him, If you will allow me to say so, I've learned by divination 
that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. And Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your cattle have fared with me. For you had little before I came and has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have turned. But now when will I also provide for my own household also? Here are some of the mistakes that we make about work that Jacob uh, clearly illustrates. Here's the first one in this text. Um, Jacob has done a good job for Laban. He's worked for him for 14 years. He's discovered that he's really unhappy in his work, which is, again, not uncommon. Um, but now he wants to change, to go back home to work. Um, he's concerned about his own household. But he's starting to buy into Laban's line for him, which is, we had next to nothing, and you've made it so much. I've been blessed because of your work. And he actually kind of echoes and agrees that, yeah, you didn't have much until I came, but now you've got a lot. Here's the mistake. Listening to those who want to make you necessary. When you come into a workplace that's been in disrepair, or come to a church that's been in trouble, and you work hard for it, and things start to change, it's only a matter of time before someone comes up and puts their arm around you and says, we were in big, big, big trouble till you arrived. And now you've made such a difference. You've, you've brought us back to life. Without you, we'd be in big, big, big trouble. Again, we just closed, we'd have to close the, do the doors to this place if we ever lost you. That stuff goes down so slick. It just, you can, you can swallow it so easily because they're trying to be affirming. But if you take that in, it is poison for your soul that you think that you are necessary to this church or to your, to your work. You're not. It's dangerous to the church and it's deadly to you for you to work yourself into a position of necessity. It is, the pastor is not the only one who does this. Think about how many church volunteers are over-functioning in church. And they're not functioning with happiness. In fact, they're actually kind of grumpy people. But if you try to get them to stop doing so much, even if you take something away from them, they're just going to take on something else because they become addicted to the necessity of their volunteerism at, at church. Only Jesus Christ is necessary for the church. The rest of us get to serve and witness to Jesus. When I was in a seminary, I was sitting in one of Bruce Metzger's classes, our New Testament professor, and he was actually lecturing on Revelation, and he always gave such um, particular lectures. He had very careful lecture notes. He's a stereotypical professor. I don't know if you've seen him or seen pictures of him, but he always had like three-piece suits and wiring glasses and white hair. Well, he probably didn't always have the white hair, but... Um. <laughs> and at one point, he's lecturing along, we're all just taking notes, and then he stopped and he looked up. He did something very uncharacteristic. He took off his glasses and he looked at the class and he says, uh, Men and women, I hope that when you become pastors, the first thing you'll do every morning is get down on your knees and thank God that you are unnecessary. I remember writing this down in my margins. Wow, thank God that I am unnecessary. Then he then went right back to his lecture notes, put the glasses back on, and um, just right back to, to what he was saying. And I was really intrigued by this. I don't remember any of the rest of the lecture. I'm sure he was lecturing on the supremacy of Christ. But I, all I remember is, pray every morning, thank God, I thank you that I'm unnecessary. I graduated, I went out to my first ministry. Uh, I kept arguing with this advice, thank God that you're unnecessary. I just couldn't get it through my head. I kept thinking, well, aren't we all needed? And isn't that almost the same thing as necessary? And the laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. And, and I kept saying, no, we need to tell people that we need them and that, that they're really uh, necessary for what we do here. And uh, at my five-year reunion, I went back to the seminary and I found Dr. Metzger walking across the quad. And so I ran up to him and I said, Dr. Metzger, five years ago in class, you had a little aside. You said, we should all thank God that we're unnecessary. And I've been thinking about this all the time. And I was just wondering if, like, maybe you wanted to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> and he's such a gentleman. He says, oh, no, no, Craig. Uh, you're, you're unnecessary. It was almost as if to say, especially you. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Then he gave me the second line that I wish he'd given the class five years ago. He says, you're too important to be necessary. You are cherished by God. And we can't love things that are necessary. Necessary is the language of addiction. Love is the language of freedom. And live out of God's love for you. Serve and work out of a joy that you get to do this because you choose to do this in freedom. Uh, live a, you know, the, out of the abundance of that freedom, including your work, but don't ever settle for being necessary because the day you become necessary, you lose your freedom. And the day you, love, you lose your freedom, you lose your love of work. And Laban is trying to make Jacob necessary to the farm, and Jacob is being so affirmed by this, he's almost ready to buy it. Enjoy it. You can never give up that freedom. We live with many callings in life, and the highest one is not to be a pastor. The highest calling is to glorify and enjoy God. And if being a pastor is making it hard for you to enjoy God, you get this time to do something else. You, you have the freedom to do that. When I was in grad school, we were working on St. Benedict's Rule for the monasteries. And I ran across one night in my exegesis of this thing, uh, this odd uh, set of instructions. He said, when you bring um, a novice into the monastery, bring him into the center of the monastery, put all the other monks around him in a circle, take off his street clothes, put on him the clothes of a monk. Then after the service of installation is over, leave the street clothes in an unlocked closet so that should he ever decide to leave the monastery, the old habits will be waiting for him. <laughs> Now, when I read that, I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense at all to me. I would think that Benedict would have them burn the street clothes and make this decision irrevocable, that you're going to be a part of the monastery. It's a vow for life. And so I said that to uh, my professor at the seminar the next day. He says, wow, Craig, that's exactly wrong. Um, <laughs> he said, what Benedict wanted was for every morning after the monk woke up, for him to go to a closet open the door and see two habits hanging there. The old habits of the street or the habits he's vowed to wear as a monk. And for him then in freedom to choose to put on the monk's habit again. So that his calling could be fulfilled, not because he had to, but because he got to, because he was free to. Because the monastery wasn't necessary to his soul. He was choosing to embrace it out of a sense of call, out of a sense of love, out of a sense of passion, but he could do something else. The relevance of this to us in ministry is once the minister feels stuck, she or he is not going to work out of joy, and then you're not going to have much joy to give in your congregation, and they need, they need you to enjoy God uh, if you're going to be of service to them. Stuck pastors are dangerous, actually, because you look for some way to get unstuck, and some of those are unhealthy things that we come up with. Much better to say, I, I choose to do this, but I, I actually could come up with plan B if I need to. I can do something else if I want. Trying to be necessary. A second thing that next happens uh, with, um, I'll get to this one quickly. When he kind of gives up on being necessary, Jacob's next idea is that, is that he's going to be prosperous. Um, when shall I also provide for my own household? He said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything if you will do this for me. I will again feed your flock and keep it. This is the most bizarre story. Hang on with us. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and as such will be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later that when you come and look into my wages with you, everyone that is not speckled or spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black. And he put them in charge of his sons, and he sent them a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, <laughs> while Jacob was pasturing the rest of the flock. Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the rods. 
he set the rods that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the rods so that the flocks produced young that were striped and speckled and spotted. And that's something you're going to find in uh, the U.S. Dictionary of Agriculture. <laughs> but what a bizarre plan. You have these two hustlers who are now trying to out-hustle each other over the speckled, spotted, and striped sheep. It comes, there comes a time, particularly for those of us who have um, entered professions where we want to make a difference as opposed to making money, that after a while, maybe, as in Jacob's case, it's like 14 years, you get to a point of realizing that all of your friends who are not so much making a difference are actually making a whole lot of money. And this making a difference thing is it's good for the soul, but it doesn't actually put your kids through college. And so you start to wonder, isn't there some way to make a little more money? Or do have I made a great mistake? And so you start to you move from worrying about trying to be necessary to worrying about trying to be prosperous. And you can come up with some bizarre schemes. I haven't heard of the speckled spotted sheep thing yet. But people will do odd things for maintaining money. And once you get set on that course, just as Jacob discovered, it's never <laughs> enough. And frankly, you don't, Jacob doesn't hold on to this stuff very long either. He tries to run away with it, and then he ends up giving it all to Esau. We'll talk some more about that tomorrow. But you don't get to hang on to it. It creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. In my pastoral care, I was always fascinated by parishioners who would come to see me to talk about how much they hated their jobs. Again, right behind relationships, hating their jobs was sky high. And so I would say, so quit. And they would say, oh, I, I, I can't quit. Why? Well, because I need it to afford my lifestyle. <laughs> and do you like your lifestyle? No, not really. <laughs> OK. So you're keeping a job that you don't like in order to afford a lifestyle that you don't like. Right. That's, that's not any less bizarre than the speckled spotted sheep. Uh, why would you give up a life that you just, just trying to afford it, something that you don't enjoy? I, 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 don't, I don't make sense of that. Quickly, number three, a, a, a third mistake that people make in work, and this is a little more controversial, I would assume with some of you, is expecting that work is going to be a source of fulfillment. Can you clarify two? Two, yeah, trying to be prosperous, reducing work to prosperity. I just, I'm spending a little time on that because I thought it was so obvious to you all. If it's not obvious, we can pick it up in the Q&A and we can talk a little bit more about what a dramatic mistake it is to reduce your work to prosperity. But trying to be fulfilled, this is what I want to take a little bit more time with. Um, when we stop thinking that work was just an inheritance, that you would do whatever your parents did or whatever your mother did as a, as a way of life, um, and we put the burden on finding a life with work, we then, it was then a logical step I mean, if you're going to find your life through work, that, you, that means that work has to be a source of your fulfillment, if you're going to have a fulfilling life. And I'm not really sure that work can handle that kind of pressure. I'm not sure about work as a source of fulfillment. I think you can have happiness at work, you can have bad days at work, good days at work, but if you make work your source of fulfillment, I think you're giving it something that belongs to Jesus Christ. And those who are absolutely convinced of Christ's delight in them and their delight in Christ, those who walk in Christ, those who have a loving relationship with Christ, they don't need work to give them that because they've already found that. So they can handle good days and bad days, high days and low days, and a whole lot of dull days that we even have in ministry. A lot of ministry is, is not exciting. It's just, you're just doing it again and again and again, as I said last night. Same things, a lot of these same things over and over and over again. Here we are for the 30th stewardship campaign. Here I go again. It's not, it's not high drama. But we do these things again and again and again because we don't expect all of ministry to be fulfilling. So sometimes when people would talk to me about their lack of happiness in their work and wanting to know about maybe I should do something different, they'd be surprised at how quickly I would say, so quick, get a different job. Really? Yeah, just don't expect that to be any more fulfilling. 
it would be different. You'll have a different set of circumstances. So we're going to be a different job, but I don't know that it's going to be a source of fulfillment, nor do I know that it should be. Family, Jesus, friendships, covenant relationships, that's where we find our fulfillment. But work is, it's work. When I was serving as a professor at pastoral ministry, I had a sign on my door because there was so much anxiety by our graduating students getting ready to go into the ministry. And I, some of the DMIN students would circle back around while working on their projects. And I knew we were going to end up with a bad conversation, or excuse me, a good conversation about a bad experience in church. So I put a placard on my door. And in that school, it was kind of the tradition that professors put all kinds of things on their doors cartoons and political statements and all that stuff. And I only had one. And my, my placard says, it's just church. Which is not because I have a low view of church, it's because I want a free church to just be all it's created to be, which is just church. I never want to take the church more seriously than Jesus does. And Jesus died for the church, but Jesus has plenty of good plans out, going outside of the church. And Jesus isn't limited to the work of the church. Jesus chooses to use the, the work of the church, just as I choose to spend my life in the vocation of the church. But I don't have to do church. It's just church. It's not Jesus. You never want to get those two things confused. Church, Jesus. They're not the same thing. If anything, a bad enough experience in church will drive you back to Jesus. And sometimes the calling of Jesus will send you back into the church and the community of the church. But don't make the church your source of fulfillment because it will let you down constantly. It's just not good at all. Um, ministry itself isn't always fulfilling. Uh, even if it's ministry outside the church, some of it's really hard. Have you ever noticed how the, many of the people who were caught up in the biblical drama with God, and would you really say their lives were fulfilling? I mean, maybe ultimately they were at the end, but along the way, you know, these people were wandering around lost a lot of the time. They were having riots that they're trying to put out, they're, they're getting rocks thrown at them. I had my first introduction to this when I was in the third grade. Our third grade Sunday school teacher, uh, Mrs. Williams, used to love to use the state-of-the-art technology at that time, which was called flannel graph. <laughs> flannel graph was this big old board, set up on an easel, it had flannel wrapped tightly around it. And as she would tell the story, she would tell, put these little characters made out of paper up on the flannel. And somehow it would stick. I think it had, maybe it was flannel on the back of it. You remember, those, you remember these things? Remember how there was always like a camel and a, a palm tree sitting up there to start the story with? And then as the story would go along, she'd put these characters up. And Mrs. Williams had these long bony fingers. And she, so she, you would always have to do this with flannel graph if you were going to get them to stay up there. You had to smooth it out and get it up there. Well, any time the Apostle Paul was used in the flannel graph stories, he took a lot of smoothing out in order to stay in place because he had been overused in the story. One time Johnny Burke and I got into a fight handing her uh, the uh, Apostle to put up there and he tore his little head right off. And so she had to tape it back on and the tape made it really hard to stay up. And then some other kids, I think it was the Vacation Bible School kids, had spilled Kool-Aid all over him, so he was purple. And so there he is up there, purple and taped together. And it was as if she was trying to proclaim a holy mystery to us in the third grade. And that is, God is not easy on the people God uses. And if you get used a lot in the story, it's going to show. Again, look at the people who get used a lot in the biblical drama. By the end of their lives, all of them are discolored and taped together. I mean, the Apostle Paul himself, he's been thrown out of half the towns in the Roman Empire, again, usually with a shower of rocks behind him. At the end, when he's writing his prison epistles, uh, he has no hope of, uh, or rational hope of freedom. But what is he writing about in Philippians? His surpassing joy. This incredible joy of Christ Jesus as Lord. Why is he so joyful even though his life has been so hard along the way? Because he got used in the story. He got used in the drama. And for that he was fulfilled. But every day at work, not so fulfilling. Being in prison, not very fulfilling experience. Being used in the drama, that's the surpassing joy. That's the source of fulfillment. That's the calling. And when these guys are anxious, or these women are anxious, 
Their anxiety is always, please don't put me aside. Don't, don't, don't stop using me in the story. And for that, they have an incredible sense of fulfillment. But the work itself, it isn't always fulfilling. It doesn't have to be. So you want to be careful about what you're actually called to do and what your jobs are. And the, don't make the job the source of fulfillment. Live out of this calling of being a part of the great drama. That's where life finds true fulfillment, I think. It's a good place to stop. Questions, comments, reactions? Maybe I wasn't following quite as closely as I could, but the, the contrast in terms of uh, your daughter's experience of choosing, uh, as you circle back on that, we talked about uh, the choice between habits. Which one are you going to choose? Is it, is it kind of our whole life in terms of a continual discernment? Uh, and so I, I, I guess I'm a little unclear on how, how the choices are. Yeah, you're talking about the Benedictine? Uh, yeah, Benedictine. Yeah, he's not, he's not so much talking about choosing an identity. He's just talking about freedom of choosing your work and your life. Your life's work, rather. As opposed to your identity. Your identity is still going to be in Christ, according to Benedictine, the whole life of prayer. I think what's happening in my daughter's generation, I just use it as an archetype. I think a lot of people in the boomers' generation have done the exact same thing. Is through these choices, I'm self-constructing a life. And Benedict would have been horrified at that. So I, I think that same thing is true. If you want to be a pastor, fine. You want to be a professor, fine. You want to be an insurance salesman, choose. But just don't think you're choosing a life when you do that. You're certainly not choosing a way to fulfill the life. Yeah? Sorry, I don't know. So you're talking about your family's multiple generation. I think they were, I guess, Tabula or Russell. North Carolina, um, but both in terms of my own family and in terms of the congregation, I it's largely an immigrant. Yeah, yeah, same thing happened. Exact same thing happened. Uh, the same time, my grandfather was trying to figure out if he could leave the farm. Just trying to save time, so I skipped over this, but I shouldn't have. Um, the same thing was happening in immigrant communities all across the country. Many, if not most, of which were urban-based. And these were families that were first generations uh, immigrants who, who had come here. And um, by the second generation and the third generation, uh, the cities were all divided up into uh, ethnically identified communities. And so you could, so you have, you have like a German neighborhood and a Polish and Chinatown and Jewish neighborhoods and all that. You could leave the apartment that you grew up in, but you couldn't leave the neighborhood. Because these neighborhoods were places of inculcating identity, just as the farm was for my grandfather. So they would have food from the old country served in the restaurants there. They would bring a priest over from the old country who would lead worship in the, in the language of the old country, all the way to inculcating and maintaining identity. And uh, all of that began to break down, again, not my grandfather's generation, but my father's generation, and, and where these communities started to di di disperse after several generations. Um, but initially they settled into these neighborhoods, not because they were the best neighborhoods they could imagine, but it's because of what they were given, and it's what they knew. So that even when the African Americans, were, slaves were emancipated, they didn't all immediately move to the northern communities. That great migration didn't happen until uh, about the 1930s. And so they stayed not far from the plantation because that's what they knew, it was their home. It was their identity was built there. They would build these communities of their own around churches, interestingly. Uh, and they knew that. When the railroads made their way out west, the Hispanic communities that greeted them and sometimes worked on them didn't take the train to go to New York. <coughs> Not because their humble village was the best life they could imagine, because it was their home. That's what they knew. So, but then in multiple generations, that begins to break out, and there is some dispersion. And my father's generation was the primary one that began that process, and the GI Bill is one of the main reasons why. And that's the same reason time people started leaving the ethnic communities and the urban communities, as well as the rural farm. Yeah. I resonated with what you said when you talked about the church versus Jesus. Um, one of the disappointments I've had in 
almost 40 years of ministry has been that there's a generation, that's an oversimplification, but for this purpose I'll use it. There's a whole generation of people that refer to their faith as an experience with the church. And I've tried a variety of ways to change the way they describe that. Like I, I came out of Hollywood Presbyterian Church years ago, and we always talked about this relationship with Jesus, Henry and Mears, that's how we all grew up with that. And then to walk into the ministry, and everybody virtually talks about how blessed they have been to this church saved their life. This church, I mean, it's just fill in the blank, change the, change the, 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 the noun from church to, or from Jesus to church, and the church has fulfilled it all. Right. And, and I think that's a really hard thing to change. I mean, it, it's just, it's sad. I, I still am with people that cannot talk about their experience of faith as something that's an encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. It's the church. Right. I think Jesus gave us the church. I, I, I can say I love the church. I'm devoted my life to the church. But I am under no illusions that the church can save me. Uh, if anything, the church just keeps <laughs> bringing me back to Jesus. Because, I mean, if, if church is the home that we're now looking for, we are in big, big trouble. I never, that's why I don't even like the term home church. Because I never want to confuse church with home. Church is where the yearning for home is rightly directed. It's directed with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the real family that the church should be talking about. Not the church family. Because the church family is, is so dysfunctional. Why do we have prayers of confession every week? know this about ourselves, don't we? And so, and it's, it's, there's no way you can, you can go the distance, I think, in ministry to the church by believing in the church. And serve the church, love the church, believe in Jesus. I remember day, Earl Palmer came in and taught a Bible study and he referred to the church as being like a donkey. Church is to work. And people were appalled. The church is a donkey. <laughs> it's an upsetting thought. Well, when you started uh, uh, yesterday, you talked about you talked a little bit about the um, the, uh, the example that you gave was a um, um, uh, prosperity gospel and why some pastors, you know, why people tend to to go there. Judgment, judgment, yeah, judgment. Oh, when you talked about and I'm just wondering, um, do you find the same, the same element of feeling, you know, um, necessary here for the, the prosperity gospel preachers? Do they have that mentality of, you know, um, necessary, <coughs> needed here because they still come even when, even when I judge them? Even when I say things upon them. Um, the reason why I'm asking this is because some of us, the immigrant churches, we are tending to, to go that way, mm -hmm. where, you know, the prosperity gospel because of the need and the poverty and the struggles that are among our immigrants. You know, that also when you preach the prosperity gospel, it tends to resonate with the experiences. So I was wondering if that setting itself can actually make the pastor feel necessary instead of what is necessary. Yeah, I, I suppose it was an interesting turning of the danger of prosperity to the earlier thing of necessary, <coughs> the prosperity gospel. I, I would imagine if you're very successful with that message, you're going to feel like you're needed there because all these people are counting on you to keep giving that message, right. which is really deadly to your own soul. And you're only going to end up trying to make them do the same thing. But there's no, it's just, it's just really hard to find any biblical warrant for necessity. Uh, it's so much dependent on, on, on what, what God is doing, what Christ is doing, and our witness of Christ. You will be my witnesses. We've made that term much more, uh, I think, uh, kind of self-dependent um, than it should be. Uh, witnesses do what? They see things and they talk about what they see. But the witness doesn't make things happen. The witness talks about what you see happening. So 
So in this case, to be Christ witnesses means you witness to what you see Christ doing. And you do that sometimes with words, and sometimes you do it with actions, and sometimes social justice programs. But we're never changing the world by our action. We're witnessing to the ways in which Christ has, has done that. I mean, ask any courtroom judge, and the judge will tell you, the last thing you want is for the witness to get creative. <laughs> the witness says, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this. So we're always witnessing to Christ's creativity, either through action or through, through words. But not, not through necessity. 